Hello and welcome to Guy Larger Gaming. My name is Temko and this is Rise and Shine, developed by Super Awesome Hyperdimensional Mega Team and published by Adult Swim Games. It is a 2D action puzzle platformer. And before you're thinking that we have yet another one of these, this game is pretty much the creme de la creme when it comes to this genre, in my opinion. It is really, really good. Not perfect, but really, really good. It's set in a world where every game character lives together in harmony that is being attacked by the aliens of Next Gen Gaming, mostly AAA shooters. And we, you are a little boy named Rise and you wield the shine, a gun that gives you the power of respawning endlessly, which in the world of games is pretty much a superpower. And you have to solve a variety of puzzles and kill a bunch of enemies with a pretty hard difficulty curve. But before we dive into gameplay proper, let's go ahead and check some settings and look at the PC performance. Settings wise, there is not a lot to talk about. There is music and there are sound sliders that don't really tell you what volume you have at, which is a little bit of a shame. I mean, it's obvious that this is on a low end and you can hear music and sound quite efficiently, but a number would still have been nice and not too much to ask. Then we have dead zone left side and dead zone right side again. Not sure what these do because they're never explained. A bit of a shame. The game doesn't have any graphical settings, but because it is a 2D stylized very specific art style, this is not necessary. The game is crisp, clean and very, very detailed. So I don't mind it not having any graphical options. The game is perfectly well put together as it is. Then we go to the controls that are fully rebindable, which is pretty damn good. The same goes for the controls on the keypad, which is also pretty damn good. No complaints whatsoever at all. This is a very solid menu for a 2D action platform puzzler. Yes, a lack of detail, but a complete set of options as far as I'm concerned. Moving away from that, the PC performance is actually pretty phenomenal. I've had a stable 60 FPS in any given situation and anything else for a 2D game would have been unacceptable, but nonetheless it happens and in this case it has not happened, so that too is really really good. And the game really flows quite smoothly with all the cutscenes and action being taken in place there being no delays or weird glitchiness at all. It is a smooth, solid PC build that delivers in every sense of the way. But let's go ahead and dive into some gameplay and talk about the game itself. Now the game has a normal mode and once you complete normal, you unlock Iron Man, which is exactly what it does in every other game. You die once, it's game over, you have to start from scratch. This is bloody difficult because the game will, will kill you repeatedly. I think I've died around 50 to 100 times in the game just completing it on normal mode. Iron Man mode, I never even got to the first boss. This is pretty damn hard. So if you want a challenge, Iron Man mode is for you. If you just want to play the game that is challenging enough as is, go with normal mode, that should do the trick. So we're gonna go with normal mode and show you about the first 10 to 15 minutes of the game. Maybe skip ahead a little bit to show you the first boss fight if we don't get around to that. So before we dive into the actual gameplay of Rise and Shine, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the graphics and world building they have done because Rise and Shine does two things extremely well, and that is game design in terms of its world cohesion, as well as level of detail for its building world. Now many 2D action platformers have a very detailed art style, and that is fine in of itself if they're not retro, but it takes a very special kind of art style and a special kind of cohesion in a game world to elevate that art style into a very solid, cohesive art design. So one of the things that Rise and Shine does phenomenally well is reference various franchises such as Samus or things like Hearts or things like Time Bonuses or Mario Stars or even things like Chainsaws you can buy. There are a lot of things that this game references, not directly in franchises, as in it doesn't reference directly into you know, Gears of War, it doesn't reference anything directly. In some cases, things like Zelda are pretty much on the nose and things like Mario are pretty obvious. But many other things are just referenced through various game mechanics. You know, you can buy chess keys in a shop that's in the background. You can't actually buy the chess keys in the game, but it's a shop in the background. You'll come across a region where the game sort of shows up and says, you know, here you can buy in-game add-ons, also in-game shops. The game exemplifies all of these little details that we have come to know from gaming in every regard. The game also doesn't shy away from being very gory. Shotgun to the head? Well, that's a head gun. The game doesn't try to hide that. If you stand on a landmine, you will go kaboom. You're a little kid with a big gun, and well, you're not designed for withstanding punishing blows. If you get hit by something, it's probably gonna smash your head in and make sure you never get up. 
The same goes for your enemies. If you shoot a dude, his head will explode. That is pretty much how the game is. So it combines this extremely cartoony level of detail with game worlds that normally don't have violence and elevates them to a more adult theme, which is done phenomenally well. I have no complaints in this regard at all. Also, the level of detail between the background and foreground really separates them at 99% of the time. There are a few occasions where back and foreground are a little bit indiscernible, but these are rare and very few in between. Overall, the separation of background and foreground, even with the level of detail the background has, is very, very good. But the gameplay standpoint, there are some issues with the game. One of the things I have issues with is that the game pacing sometimes breaks off to have you solve a environmental puzzle. But this isn't an issue for 9 out of 10 situations. The game goes from action to action, from hard encounter to hard encounter, where most of the solving is you learning game mechanics or figuring out a way to deal with various hordes of mobs. You know, you've got two or three mobs attacking from one side and a bomb landing from the top. All of these things you can solve fairly easily by knowing what to do. You can shoot enemy projectiles out of the sky, you can you know, use Tesla guns to make an enemy go distract themselves or make them short circuit if it's a robot enemy. You can use your homing projectiles and your aim projectiles to go around obstacles on the field. And all of this you'll need to do to solve various bosses, which is also a thing the game does really well. But where my main issue is that the game kind of hates explaining itself too much. It'll explain base core mechanics, but the game really hates explaining puzzles or new puzzle mechanics. A very specific puzzle cost me a good 20 minutes to solve simply because I did not understand what the game desired me to do. And I tried a variety of different things, even quit the game and just sort of tried to calm my mind because I was getting seriously frustrated at a game that, well, while challenging, wasn't frustrating. The game plays a lot like Dark Souls in many regards. The bosses are difficult, the encounters are hard, the game is not forgiving, but everything is cohesive with its mechanics. So once you figure out a certain mechanic and you figure out a certain counter to an enemy, that counter will work. The enemies behave consistently. The game also isn't unfair in its difficulty. It's not that, like suddenly you'll stand up on a mine you never could see before. The game clearly choreographs these things. The game clearly shows these things. And every new thing the game encounters or any new thing the game throws at you, it sort of explains in either a mini cutscene or a pseudo cutscene, or it sort of explains it to you by showing something in the background that's happening. And then it throws you in the deep end and says, oh, now deal with it. But for these environmental puzzles, in many situations, you're just clicking left and right, trial and erroring until you solve them, which is a massive break in the pacing of the game, as well as the difficulty curve of the game. It moves away from mechanical competence into trial and error. I'm not a fan of that. But it's a minor gripe in an overall excellent pacing of a very cool action platformer. And I keep calling it a platformer, but, but it's more of a 2D action title than anything else. Platforming is very minimal, and I saw these few environmental puzzles. Most of the puzzles you solve are in combat or real-time tactical puzzles, where you have to make sure an enemy gets hit in a very specific spot, where you have to go around and survive when an enemy throws bombs at you, where you have to deal with different types of enemies at the same time using different types of guns. One homing, one sticky bomb, one needs a electric pulse, one needs maybe to be hit in a very specific spot to drop their shields. All of these different varieties get introduced with more complexity later down the line, and with each new enemy you encounter, you end up having to face different types of enemies in different combinations. And this is where the game shines in excellence. Every time you're in combat, and every time even if you die, the quick save system helps out a lot. You feel a sense of accomplishment. Every fight is a unique challenge. There's not a wave of grunts just forcing their way onto you, and you just sort of have to deal with them to get to the interesting boss fights. And the boss fights are very interesting, but every encounter in the game, be it a single grunt throwing barrels of fire at you, or be it a minefield where you have to cross, or be it a wave after wave of robotic enemies you have to crush, Every encounter is challenging and thus satisfying when you complete them. The game also doesn't mind throwing in a few curveballs in regards to forcing you to, for example, not fight a boss but merely survive to get to the next stage. In the very first level, before you ever get to the first real boss, there is a mini boss encounter, and you'll probably see it on screen here, where you have to survive against a tank. And that both fits thematically because you're just a little kid. How are you gonna deal with a massive tank with just a little pistol? But the game doesn't force you to fight a tank, it forces you to survive the tank while trying to get into a shelter. All of that is pretty damn solid, no complaints at all. And every type of encounter also provides different solutions. Some only have one solution, you know, hit the weak spot on the boss, that's it. Others have many solutions. Maybe you can dodge through them, maybe you can dash through them, maybe you can kill the mines while they pop up. There are a variety of different solutions for all of this, and that is damn good. So to bring it all together a little bit, the art design for the game is very clear, very unique, 
and very well put together. It is one of the most detailed 2D games I have encountered to date. And the game world that they have designed with all the gaming references, not on your face but just in the background a little bit, are really, really cool. There is no complaints here and as a gamer you will recognize many of these and it's a cool little thing extra that doesn't take away from the game. Really good. The game pacing, outside of some environmental puzzles where the game really slows down for no particular reason, is also very excellent. No complaints here at all. Then we get to the combat and the challenge of combat and there you end up having very progressively more difficult encounters as you progressively get more interesting game mechanics introduced and while at the same time you get more interesting and more intricate ways of using mechanics and you get familiar with the controls and the different mechanics available. This progressive difficulty is very well designed and I have no complaints here at all. When we get to the difficulty part and how it translates to how well you feel in frustration and satisfaction, that too is excellent. But there are two things we haven't talked about yet. One is sound design and the other is difficulty curve. The game only has one difficulty mode and if you find it too challenging or if you don't enjoy that kind of gameplay, this game might not be for you. And the game is not apologetic about it. It is exactly what it says on the tin and it doesn't shy away from that. And that is really good. But the only way you can play this game is either hard or, well, Iron Man mode, which is even harder. And not sure that every person that enjoys this type of game will actually enjoy that. There's a lot of very difficult games on the market that are difficult for difficulty's sake. And this isn't one of them, but it still is a very challenging game. And if you're not into that sort of thing, then this might not be the game for you. If you are, this is a prime example of a game that does challenge and difficulty curves extremely well. I already talked about my issues with the, some of the environmental puzzles, but I'd like to mention that the various mechanics that are introduced to the game are also used for all these different encounters. And while some of them are not that interesting or that unique in and of themselves, the game still provides an interesting challenge with each and every one of them. Most of the puzzles are never rehashed. You don't get much of the same happening time and time again. Once a mechanic has been used, it will be introduced as part of a new puzzle, but it will never be used in an identical fashion. Overall, the game does a phenomenal job of all of this, including introducing it to new environments and new mechanical aspects. So moving away from that, let's talk a little bit about the way you feel as a character in the world, because not a lot of games have a good feel for the character. Your Most of your enjoyment from a game, or most of the experience you have of a game, is based around how well the story is designed, how well cutscenes are put together, but because this game does have cutscenes, but they are very minimal, there are many reasons to say, okay, most of the feeling you get from this world, most of the danger, and most of the sense of urgency you create in this world, are through the way the character plays. You're playing a little kid with a massive gun. Just the guns available for you makes a huge difference. You as a little kid are pretty powerless. You're basically an extension for the gun. You're weak, you can die in one shot from everything basically, and well, everything else will sort of hopefully keep you alive. And the gun gives you infinite respawn, so that's your main purpose, is to carry that gun and hopefully survive long enough. But the gun provides a different set of challenges with it. When you shoot a gun, the recoil of that revolver is going to push you back away, so you have to realign your character if you're shooting many bullets at the same time. Jumping with a gun, you know, the gun shoots off a shell and you jump a little bit higher, it gives you double jump abilities. There is a very interesting narrative here between the character and the gun, and one without the other wouldn't work. The gun needs a carrier, and well, you're the carrier, and the carrier needs his gun because, well, as a little kid, it's not gonna be much use to anyone. And that is something I like because while you are the main character, you are Rise, you are the protagonist of the story, you have been given a magical quest. Without the gun, you're really nothing. And the gun knows it. So there's some banter and there's some interaction between the two that really provides a unique perspective on saying, okay, well, this is a devastating war, people are dying, and, and there's enough gore to go around that people are dying, that it showcases quite effectively what is going on. This is a pretty bad war and a pretty bad situation, and it's it's not great as a kid, and you're way out of your depth. So even when you encounter big bosses, the fact that they're challenging seems logical. Because you're a little kid in this very detailed world, I really enjoy this different aspect it creates where you're sort of like, okay, well, yeah, but I'm a little kid. I'm going to deal with this massive robot shooting laser guns at me. And that is pretty cool. Each boss fight is very unique, very well designed, very challenging as well. But as I said, each mechanic in the game is always introduced in such a way that you know what you can expect. There is a part where you have to hit the boss a big red button on his back and you have to call your bullets around a radio tower. You've seen this because that's where you were introduced very early on in the level. You know you can shoot his projectiles out of the sky because you were introduced to that mechanic earlier on. You know how to dodge missiles that come down because again you were introduced to this mechanic earlier on. All of this really combines a very unique way of fighting a boss. The mechanics that you get presented with are very very good. 
they're very well designed and the boss is very cohesive in using them. But because you're familiar with the mechanics, it's not a matter of learning the new mechanics as many games have in many situations. It's combining the timings and the different the way the different mechanics work in this particular boss fight to complete the boss challenge. And that makes Rise and Shine a truly outstanding 2D action game. So overall, Rise and Shine has good sound design, insanely good art design, massively good pacing, except for one or two issues where you have them, a good PC build with rebindable controls, interesting boss fights, and interesting gameplay mechanics. So the game is coming out on January 13th for the price of $15 or your regional equivalent. And there's one last critique I can say about the title, it is combining the replay value as well as the game length. The game in total took me about four and a half hours to finish and a second playthrough only took me about four hours based on that I already knew what I could expect and already know what the puzzles did. So expect four to five hours for your first full playthrough. But the game is very lacking replay value unless you enjoy challenging yourself with the Iron Man mode. The game does not have any challenging extra runs or extra options and the few available mini games in the game are only fun for about half an hour to an hour maximum before you really get bored of them because they are mechanically very simple. Overall, Rise and Shine at $15 is a very well put together title that really hits the mark in what it tries to achieve with a unique art style well put together that delivers a unique story, well paced and well designed with barely any flaws I can speak of. But at that price point and with that replay value, it could be a hard bargain for some people. So whether or not you find the game is worth your hard earned money is up to you, but I do wholly encourage you to check it out over on Steam on January 13th and there's a link in the description below for exactly that purpose. So thank you for watching, if you liked this video, press that like button below. If you didn't like this video, there's a dislike button for exactly that purpose and leave a comment. Tell us what you liked, tell us what you didn't like. Tell us what we can do better. We want to hear back from all of you. And if you want to see more content like this on the channel, just press that subscribe button down below and we will deliver. And until then, I wish you a good day and until next time, right here on Guy Logic Gaming.